ಯೋಗೇನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಮಲ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರುತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಬಾಹು ಪುರುಷಾಕಾರ ಶಂಖಚಕ್ರಸಿಧಾರಿಣ ಸಹಸ್ರಶಿರಸ ಶ್ವೇತ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಹರಿ ವಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೂರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಸರ್ವೋಪನಿಷದೋ ಗಾವೋ ದೂಗ್ಧಾಗೋಪಾಲನಂದನ ಪಾರ್ಥೋ ವತ್ಸ ಸುಧೀರ್ಭೋಕ್ತ ದುಗ್ಧ ಗೀತಾಮೃತ ಮಹತ್ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಸೊ ವಿ ವರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಸ್ಟಿಲ್ ದ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ತ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಆಫ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಆನ್ ಪೇಜ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ಟೂ of the small book ajo bisanna vyayatma bhutana mi shwaro bisan prakritim swamadhishthaya sambhavami atma mayaya even though i am unborn and imperishable and as consciousness i am the master the lord of all beings yet i manifest myself sambhavami i manifest myself this is what we were discussing we were discussing the manifestations the avataras that took birth on the indian subcontinent and are part of the spiritual history of india for those who were here in our previous discussion we talked about first of all for the purpose of meditation even though every manifestation is a manifestation of that supreme divinity because there is nothing nothing else which can manifest every human being every creature every tree every entity is a manifestation of that consciousness yet for the purpose of meditation because meditation is always about focusing one one's mind on one thing what Patanj- what patanjali calls eka tatva abhyasa the practice of focusing directing the awareness of one's mind on one single object that is called eka tatva abhyasa so eka tat for that for ekatattva abhyasa for the practice of focusing one's mind on one thing a person has to become selective there is no other choice one has to become selective one has to select one thing either one way of selecting one thing is what we discussed yesterday considering for example the whole solar system as one entity and meditating on that as one entity as one meditating on brahma meditating on hiranyagarbha meditating on prana that is one way but again that requires a lot of understanding a lot of deep insight a lot of comprehension of what we are talking about and uh, so the easiest way is to choose an entity which is special in its own group 
And that is what we called vibhutis. The 10th chapter lists some of such vibhutis, but Sri Krishna points it out very clearly that they can be endless. And vibhuti avatara, avataras are endless, vibhutis are endless. Out of these, some have been listed in the 10th chapter, and what the masters did, they again distilled the list even a little bit further and came out with 24 such personalities from the spiritual history of India. Uh, she might like to have a blanket, because it's really cold. <coughs> so they chose these 24 forms whose lives, whose biography, whose teachings are widely respected, widely read, and whose life is widely followed. These become the 24 major, 24 avatars, 24 incarnations. And out of these, again, when the list was distilled a little bit further, then they came up with the 10 avatars, with the 10 incarnations, which uh, we see in, uh, in, in temples, in traditional poetry, they have been celebrated through pictures, through sculptures, through temples, through theater, through dances, through every possible expression of art, they were, they were used as a symbol, their form, their name, was used because artistic expression requires symbols. You cannot, you cannot express something without symbols. So how to express the nameless and formless in art, in words, the same problem is with words and the same problem is with, with arts because artistic expression is, includes a form, has a form. Not always, not always. Sorry? Yeah, allegories are there. Yes. So, in India, artistic expression primarily evolved around uh, these ten, out of which the first five we had already discussed. The, uh, if you remember the, the division that we made yesterday, Shruti and Smriti, Shruti and Smriti, the first five can be found in the Shrutis. The second group of five is not found, at least directly mentioned in the Shrutis. For example, uh, Kurma Avatara, Varaha, Nrisimha, they are sort of mentioned in the Brahmana texts. But Rama, Krishna, Parashurama, Buddha, they are later. They, even chronologically, they came into existence within the Vedic tradition after the Vedas were already established. So you cannot expect them to be mentioned in the Vedas themselves. Rama went to his master to study the Vedas. Krishna went to his master to, to study the Vedas. So the Vedas were already established, well established. They were born in the Vedic tradition. So they are primarily the subject matter of the Smriti texts, of the Puranas, of Mahabharata, of Ramayana, of all these later texts, which as I said, Smriti means when the masters contemplated the meanings of the Vedas, they came up. Because Smriti means contemplation. Contemplation on what? Contemplation on the deeper meanings of the Vedas. Vedas rather avoid any such name and form. They altogether, they avoid. And whatever names and forms are there, they are rather... Uh, Objects in nature, such as wind, fire, and all these entities, not a particular human being, not a human. In the Vedas, you, you don't find that. But uh, that is the reason that some people uh, think the Vedas to be writings of nature worshippers, though that is very superficial, because uh, when the Vedic master speaks, for example, of the fire, he just uses the word Agni, which is the word for external fire. But 
Every Vedic mantra, they, they make it very clear, has three levels of meaning. So on the first level, it refers to the external fire, which is burning in the fire pit when fire ceremonies are being done. But then there comes the Adhidaivika aspect, the consciousness which manifests itself in the form of that fire. That is the second thing. He does not worship the physical fire. Through that physical fire, his goal is the consciousness, the energy, the universal energy which has manifested in the form of wind, in the form of water, in the form of fire, in the form of these elements. So through that, he's worshipping, the Vedic Rishi is worshipping that consciousness and he's mindful of that consciousness. He wants to develop through that worship the awareness of that consciousness. That is the second level. And then the third level is to find that because whatever his idea is whatever exists macrocosmically also exists microcosmically. Which means if the fire element is out there then it also exists within me. So to find that within himself that is the third stage in which first of all he finds the physical fire with, within himself, which is the heat and the warmth that we experience, for example. But again, that is just the physical aspect. Then comes the deeper aspect of, of fire, that fiery manifestation of consciousness within, which, they, for example, in the case of fire, it is speech. They relate speech with fire. Why is it? I'm not getting into that explanation right now because that's away from the subject matter that we are discussing. But just to give you an idea how, why the Vedas are not simply a, a method of worshipping physical nature, but they go deep within the essence of external nature and then the ultimate goal is is always not out there, but within. And that's, for, that's, that's why the deepest meaning of the Veda is in Adhyatmika, what they call Adhyatmika meaning, esoteric meaning, inner meaning, in which the Vaidika Mantra is explained as talking about an entity that is within. But that, to understand that meaning, a person has to go deeper into the Upanishads. That is the whole idea. So the Vedas are about that. But uh, to give this to the common people who, uh, by the common people, we just mean people who cannot dedicate 24-7 to this, who have other engagements, who have, uh, who have who have, who have a family to take care of, who have a business to take care of, who have their duties as a king or as all these things. And they cannot, they cannot uh, engage themselves 24-7 with these things. It's, a, it's, it's okay for a certain group of people who can dedicate their lives to it. But for everybody, this becomes sometimes too much, sometimes difficult. And for them, the masters, after contemplating those teachings, they came up with these Puranas. The whole idea of the Smriti is actually to create something which can be followed by the masses, who cannot dedicate all their time to the deep esoteric teachings of the Vedas. And that is where the five later avatars are mentioned. So, for example, the sixth one, Parashurama, he, his, his life is about uh, annihilating the unrighteous kings that were the cause of poverty in this country because they, had, they, they, were, just, they were just taking away things from their subject which, even, which did not belong them and they had no authority over it. And yet they would simply because they thought we are the king of this country, everything in this country belongs to us, so we can do anything. If there is something good with, with somebody of, of our subjects, because I'm the king, I'm the ruler, I can take it away without even asking him. And if he resists, I have all authority to take it away against his wish. 
And this is what the kings were doing in his time. They did it with his own father. And uh, uh, eventually it led to, uh, to, to such a clash when he went back and uh, he tried because he was a powerful man. So he brought back that cow. It was, it, it, cow was a token of wealth in ancient India. And it was a beautiful cow with a calf. And it was taken away by, by, the, by the king. So he went there, he fought his way through and brought it back. And as a result, what, he, what they then did, they killed his father. And then the whole war, on one side you had this Parashurama, and on the other side you had all the kings who were... Uh, this, this story goes on. So Parashurama is about that. Then the next one, Rama, is the perfect king, the ideal king how a king should be completely dedicated to worldly affairs, deeply self-enlightened, and finding that balance between self-enlightenment, between deep wisdom and worldly affairs. Because in king is where the mundane and the spiritual have to meet. A king cannot run away from his duty. At the same time, he has to be mindful of the practicalities and deep down, he's also aware of the deep spiritual truths. So Rama gives that balance. And uh, the Buddha, for example, the Buddha is the other extreme of Rama. The Buddha completely left, us, left Rama also left the kingdom for a while because he had to, so he left it. But then again he came back and he became the king. On the other hand, Buddha left it altogether. So he's the perfect example of, of otherworldly affairs, completely dedicated to otherworldly affairs. This is what the Buddha stands for, the perfect monk. He idealizes that. And Krishna beautifully presents both. Because in Krishna, though Krishna is not presented as a as an externally monastic person, but deep within him, he is a complete monk, no less than the Buddha himself. He meditates, and at the same time, he also leads a life like Rama. So Krishna has inspired this devotional movement in India, which has existed at least for over uh, 2,000 years and has swept the country on a very grassroot level, especially within the last 1,000 years, Krishna has been at the center of this movement in the sense that he is the object of, of this movement, in the sense that he is the primary deity of all those that were leading personalities in this movement that swept across India over the last 1,000, 1,200 years. And therefore, all aesthetic presentations revolve around him. Because uh, I, I think uh, we, we, in our previous discussion, one of our previous discussions, when I explained uh, the meaning of the word Bhagavan, I said that uh, Bhaga means the six qualities, six virtues. The first one is dominion, lordship. The second one, dharma, righteousness, fame, shri, beauty, jnana, wisdom, and vairagya, detachment. Lack of coloring from worldly objects. So, when we look at the lives of uh, these 24 incarnations, some of them manifest one aspect more and yet lack a little bit in others. Rama and Krishna, these two are the only ones that manifest every aspect of amongst all these six in them. That is why they are often referred to as Bhagavan Rama and Bhagavan Krishna. Krishna additionally, what he 
th th these are the devotional, tr the, the discussions of the devotional traditions that we find in the scriptures. What he additionally manifests and which no one else manifests is Madhurya Bhava, sweetness sweetness through his leelas through his pastimes what he manifests is that that because when we speak of brahman the upanishadic brahman the nameless formless pure consciousness there are three things sat pure existence chit pure consciousness and the third one ananda bliss happiness joy, inner joy, inner peace, inner fulfillment. That is something that no one else manifests in the way Krishna does. So, the devotional traditions, for them, when they explain the devotional path, the culmination of devotional path is to experience Madhurya Bhava, the feeling of sweetness in one's life. Krishna Radha, they both, their, their pastimes, they represent, they manifest that sweetness in one's life. It is in that sense that uh, uh, Sri Krishna, it is this reason that Sri Krishna has been at the center of the devotional traditions and the whole philosophy of the devotional path which, uh, which has been which, uh, which has been beautifully explained by Abhinav Guptacharya. It started with the writings of Abhinav Guptacharya, Kashmir Shaivism writer, when he wrote commentaries on Bharata Muni's Natya Shastra, which is a text on aesthetics and which is a text on dance. He started writing commentary in the 10th century on that and then slowly and slowly it evolved in the Gaudiya devotional traditions which came up with these masterpieces on the feelings that a person can have on the devotional path. How his, all his emotions, how he trains his emotions to be directed towards one single entity. Coming back again to Ekatattva Bhyasa. So if in yoga, in Raja Yoga, in Hatha Yoga, we direct our consciousness, our awareness to one single goal. That is what meditation is about. The devotional traditions direct all emotions that come up. They train them, they allow them to come up and they are about directing them towards one single aspect. So Krishna becomes that, uh, that a means, it is the form of Krishna, what I'm bringing this to, that the form of Krishna has become a means to raise the awareness of thousands and thousands and I should say millions and millions of people throughout the generations to, to that formless supreme divinity. In that sense, he is considered an avatar. He is considered an incarnation. Throughout India, may it be the Alvar saints of South India, the 60 Alvar saints of South India, who, were, who had nothing. They were, they, were, they, were, they were living like beggars. Yet, the devotional movement started from there and then kept on sweeping the whole country into the north. So it came from there. Then we have these great masters, Jnana Deva, Jnaneshwara, who wrote an amazing commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, Namadeva, Tukaram, who were famous, uh, for example, Namadeva was famous, uh, Ekanath was famous for never becoming angry in his life. Whatever you would do with him, he would never ever become angry. So these great masters of, uh, of Maharashtra, of the state, that is there around Bombay. Then when you come to Gujarat, you have Narsi Mehta, for example, whose songs were dear to Mahatma Gandhi. It was one of his songs, Vaishnav Janato, a devotee of Vishnu is someone who can relate with the pain of others, who has tears in his eyes when he sees others in pain and does everything to alleviate uh, that pain. Then you come to Bengal, you have this big, 
uh, Gaudiya tradition which started with uh, you coming to the East, uh, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you know, who inspired the Baal singers, Jayadeva. Then you go further to Assam, you have Shankara Deva who inspired a Satriya dance and a complete tradition which are Vaishnavas, they worship Krishna but you will never see a statue in their temples of Krishna. They don't worship a statue, they worship no form, they worship the formless. Yet their entire teachings and everything, all traditions uh, evolve around Krishna. So that you find in Assam. Then you come to where Krishna was actually born then in Vrindavan, in that Delhi, uh, around that region, Agra, there you have all these great uh, saintly people, Mirabai, uh, uh, Suradas, the greatest uh, uh, poet of Hindi literature, all these. So like this you can see the devotional tradition under Krishna has swept throughout the whole nation and these were the people they were never associated with any king mostly all of them when the kings heard of them they wanted to invite them to their courts and yet they always said no if the king wants to come and listen to us let him come into my humble hermitage there is no reason for us there is no need for us to go to them so many great kings such as Akbar for example the great Akbar the great Mughal emperor he used to visit he visited Mirabai in her hermitage mm -hmm. he visited uh, Surdas in his hermitage Surdas was a blind poet yet one of the greatest uh, poets of Hindi literature and then how can one remember the five, how can one forget the five great acharyas of Indian uh, philosophies, Ramanuja Acharya, Vallabha Acharya, Nimbarka Acharya, Madhva Acharya, and Shankara Acharya. All these five who have developed the philosophy, the major philosophical systems which are followed today by all people in India, each one of the traditions accepts one of these five philosophical systems, they were all Krishna devotees. They were all deeply dedicated to Krishna. So, my point of telling here is just that the form of Krishna becomes a finger to point into the direction of that formless Krishna, what Krishna actually stands for, that formless essence. When Krishna speaks of himself, he's not speaking of that limited personality there are and for that when when we use the word we as krishna devotees for example i as a krishna devotee when i use the word krishna i use it to refer to two very distinct entities one is that form that is there but then one is that formless omnipresent consciousness which the upanishads call om which the upanishads call brahman as pure consciousness, I just use an additional word, Krishna, for it. That's all. And that form just becomes a pointing finger to that formless entity. That's all. There can be many pointing fin fingers. This is just one of many pointing fingers. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, and this relates to our understanding of the Bhagavad Gita. Whenever Krishna refers to himself, he does not refer to that form, he does not refer to that physical body, but he refers to that essence within him, which is what he refers to as I. Because Krishna, the Krishna that was born 5,500 years ago, that person, he's just one of many vibhutis. Look at the 10th chapter. If you look at the 10th chapter, he gives a very big list of vibhutis. And there he says, amongst the Vrishni clan, I am Krishna. And amongst the Kaurava clan, I am Arjuna. And amongst the ancient kings, I am Rama. So he's just putting his form, that limited form, he's just putting amongst endless manifestations that he, the essential nature of him actually had. So this 
to appreciate what I'm trying to tell. This is what, how mysticism deals with the idea of God. I think every religion does that, whether it is the Sufi mystics. When Sufi mystics, they refer to the personal aspect of religion, Allah. And then when, uh, when for example, someone like Mansur al-Hallaj, he speaks of an al-haq, I am the supreme truth, that impersonal aspect of the divinity. Religion is limited to Allah, but the mystic takes it a step further, in which even Allah exists, that formless. And this is where the religious start to have a problem, and that is the reason Mansur was, was, was crucified brutally like Christ. Being one of the great, despite being one of the greatest Sufi mystics. We find the same idea in, 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 in uh, Meister Eckhart, in this great German mystic, Christian mystic, when he speaks of God, and then he speaks of Gottheit, in German, God, Godhead, or Godhood, not Godhead, as the head of many gods, but Godhood. God and Godhood, that state, that being, which for him is even greater, is even higher. Religion is about God, but the mystic is about Godhood. So when we use the word Krishna in the, in, 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 in the Vedantic traditions, then God simply becomes a pointing finger to Godhead, to God. To, to that Gothheit, to that Brahman. When we get lost in words, then there are so many words which are used, different traditions use different words. But when the idea of using all these words is so that we can grasp the concept. And it is in there that the distinction between God, between the creator and the created merges. There is no difference anymore. So that is what ultimately Krishna, the word Krishna, when we use the word Krishna, stands for. It's not really that name and the form, but it is the nameless, formless principles of the Upanishad, which has no name. The idea is it is Anama and Arupa. It, is, it has no name and it has no form. And on the other side, Equally true is that all names are its names and all forms are its forms and therefore Krishna's name and Krishna's form is also one of its thousands names and forms and therefore we can refer to it as Krishna as well within one particular tradition. Other traditions, they will refer to it to other different ways. But someone who has seen that underlying unity of all them, the, the reality beneath those words. Otherwise, people start fighting on words. I mean, in, 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 in Malaysia now, uh, the Malaysian government does not want, to, want the Christian missionaries to use the word Allah. Yet, in all Arabic countries, all Christians use the word Allah because the Arabic word for God is Allah. So if you read the Arabic translation of the Bible, the word is Allah. So, but they have a problem, so they, they say, no, this, this is just a Muslim word, and therefore it can only be used in Islamic traditions, then you start fighting. When you fail to see that inherent, deep down, unity, when the moment we get lost in symbols, the moment we start emphasizing on symbols, we have lost the ultimate essence. So by, why I have, now I'm, um, finished with this discussion, why have uh, dedicated so much time in discussing these symbols so that we can see the underlying unity and then it doesn't matter anymore whether we refer to it as Krishna, whether we refer to it as Christ, whether we refer to it as, as any other possible name, it doesn't matter anymore. This is what uh, the, the great masters of India realized Narayanendra Saraswati beautifully mentions it in his, 
in his commentary, Sanskrit commentary on the Mandala Brahmana, one of the Vedic texts that uh, speaks of the sun being worshipped in all manifestations. And he, he, was, he was, I think, in the 14th, 15th or 16th century. So he says that supreme principle was, is worshipped also by the non-Indian traditions who have come to India. They have their own names, they have their own concepts, but they worship the same divinity, which was then taken up by Swami Vivekananda, by Ramakrishna Paramahansa, by great yoga masters like Swami Shivananda, and in Mahatma Gandhi, when he used to say that because I am a Hindu, I am a Muslim, I am a Christian, I am a Jew, because I am a Hindu, I am all these together, when he said that, then these ideas, they are rooted in this understanding. And this is what Vedanta is about. It leads us into the Upanishadic teachings. They lead us deep beyond the symbols that a particular group of people has used. And because of that identification might lead into conflict with other group who have a different kind of identification. So in that sense, these deep yogic teachings, these deep Upanishadic Vedantic teachings are particularly very meaningful in today's world where a great amount of our suffering is simply because of this. Everything that is happening today seems to be either around money, wealth, power, or around these symbols. Just, it's the, the clash of civilization is around either. It has always been around wealth. It has always been around these things. But these symbols, these beautiful symbols, which should take us deeper, have become the cause of so much misery, which should have led us into bliss, into inner joy, the joy within. These symbols are becoming, have become the cause of so much misery. So we have to learn to see beyond them. And this is the reason we are having these discussions. So, should we continue with, an, should we start studying a new verse or should we leave it and just have a short discussion for a few more minutes? Uh, question answer session or would you like me to start a new verse? Still 20 minutes to go. Sorry? Start a new one. Okay. <laughs> I would have to leave the shloka in between. I can start with the shloka and uh, say 10 minutes uh, to it, and then we can have 10 minutes of questions. Oh, what should I? <laughs> okay. So then let us pronounce it and let us start, start with it. Yada. 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 I for, he has for, he has forgotten some lere. The bandho gya. Okay, no problem. Jane. Yada yada. Yada yada. Yada yada. Hidharmasya. 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 Glanir. Glanir. Glanir Bhavati 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 Bharata 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 Abhyutthanam 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 Adharmasya 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 Tadatmanam 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 Srijamyaham 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 This distinction of Shruti and Smriti, which we discussed yesterday and which I mentioned a little bit today also, this, discuss, this distinction has saved India from a lot of fundamentalism. Why? Because the Shruti 
has always been universal. It has very few symbols, and these symbols are very universal. You cannot, you cannot limit them to a particular sect. And they are used by all the different traditions that came into existence. And Smriti, which was the source of all the different traditions, they have no divine authority. They are human creation. So in that sense, for example, now look at Islam. You have the Quran, Sharia law, which is divinely, which is a divine law. And so it has no scope for change. But here, all the Dharma Shastras, all the scriptures that lead with, that deal with, uh, with, with law of the state and all these things, they are all of human creation. All, only their fundamental principles have been mentioned in the Vedas, but they are very universal in nature. So, uh, that is the reason in India, even though there have been these three major uh, traditions within Hinduism, plus Buddhism and Jainism as well, these five major religions, they have never fought amongst each other in the way that uh, we find, for example, the three Semitic religions to be fighting with each other. They, but as I say again and again, uh, uh, these three are as distinct as Islam, Judaism and Christianity are from each other. Yet, the masters who had studied at least the Vedas, the Upanishads, they could always tell their followers that deep down, whether he is worshipping Shiva, we are worshipping Vishnu, or they are worshipping Shakti, we are worshipping the same entity. So don't get deluded by this difference. They were at least there to tell them. That is what all the masters did. That is why they appealed so much. All the great masters that I have mentioned just earlier, one of their work was always what they called Samanvaya. Samanvaya means to unite, to bring together everybody. The final message of the Rig Veda, Sangachadvam, walk together, Samvadadvam, speak together. And samani vah akutihi, let your intentions be the same, let your hearts be of one accord. So that final message, they have always adhered to that. And to adhere to the deeper principles uh, of... So this is something that I think the Upanishads can give, can teach to the rest of the world, which is engrossed in fighting over symbols. So, yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata, whenever, when, always when, dharmasya, when righteousness, dharma, the whole, Gita is a, the whole Gita is about dharma. The first word in Gita is dharma, dharma kshetre, kuru kshetre. The first letter in the Bhagavad Gita is dhar, and the last letter in the Bhagavad Gita is ma. So the whole Gita is actually lies between these two letters. The whole Bhagavad Gita is about dharma. So what does dharma mean? Dharma, dharma, dhri means to uphold, to bear. That is what dhri means. So the noble principles, the noble virtues that help the individual to evolve, that upholds the individual. These noble virtues, and because they uphold the individual, if they manifest into the society, they also uphold the society. Such principles are called dharma. And they transcend all symbols. They, are, they, have, they have no symbol. And this was the most unfortunate thing that happened in India, that people started using the word dharma in India in Hindi for religion. Because dharma is not religion. Though in Hindi everybody says, what is tumara dharma kya hai? What is your dharma? My dharma is Islam. As if dharma can be different from religion to religion. No. Dharma is truthfulness. Dharma is love. No religion deep down actually teaches anything against these noble principles. Every religion is about that. So dharma, that, is, that is why the masters have kept on telling that Pantha, the paths are different, but dharma cannot be many. You cannot have many. That's, that is why they, they sometimes object 
when there are these meetings, you know, interfaith meetings in India, they are called Sarva Dharma Samanvaya Goshti, in which all the dharmas come together. Then the ma my master, for example, when he would go to such a Goshti, he would say, you cannot have many religions, you cannot have many dharmas. It's not possible. Dharma will always be one. So that was an unfortunate happening which led to a lot of confusion. In the Vedic tradition, the supreme dharma is always non-violence, ahimsa. The desire to inflict no pain and suffering on somebody else. And everything else, all other noble virtues are meaningful as long as they uphold, strengthen and refine this principle of non-violence. So for example, truthfulness is required because usually lying goes together with committing violence towards someone else. When we want to commit violence, when we want to cheat, when we want to do something like this, then we lie. Otherwise we have no reason to lie. So similarly, Veda Vyasa in his commentary on the Yoga Sutras when Patanjali speaks of the Yamas and Niyamas and the first Yama is Ahimsa. He makes it very clear that Ahimsa is the supreme virtue. All other Yamas and Niyamas are simply meaningful because they strengthen, they make us capable of refining our Ahimsa even further to make our non-violence even deeper and stronger and more subtle, more sublime. So when the Mahabharata, of which the Bhagavad Gita is one part, says eight times, no less than eight times, Ahimsa Paramo Dharma, it repeats eight times, Ahimsa Paramo Dharma, Ahimsa, non-violence, is the greatest dharma. And the definition that it provides, Yato Abhyudaya Nishriya Sasiddhisa Dharma, Dharma is that which helps us to arise, Abhyudaya, which means which helps us to arise internally, to evolve into a good human being, and then acquire Nishriyasa, the best in our life. Maybe not always Priya, not what is dear, but what is Hita, what is beneficial for us and what is beneficial for the entire society. And it is very logical that what would be ultimately beneficial for the whole society will also be beneficial for us because we are just... The idea is always, it goes back to look at oneself as not always as a single individual in the society, as a, but also sometimes to look at oneself as a unit, as a part of that Hiranyagarbha that we talked of. We are just one cell, and a cell, a neuron, does its own duty. A muscular cell has its own duty. The cells lining my intestine have another duty. Each one of these cells has a duty, yet working together, they make the existence of this body possible. Society itself was also looked, as, looked upon by the masters as a single organism, and these individuals were part of the society. So one way of looking at it is an individualistic way in which the individual is the center of the society. The other way is looking at the same but as the individual just mere as a part of a wider society, a wider kingdom and his duties according to that. So dharma is about that which allows us to arise, to evolve and then allows us to acquire the best, nishreyasa, what is considered the highest. So even the practices, and this is what I think Patanjali, where Patanjali comes into the picture, the, more, the practices of asana, pranayama, meditation, dhyana, they have to be seen in this wider picture where a person lacks the internal strength, though we know that this is the correct thing to do, yet we are incapable of doing it because we have not enough control over our body. We have not enough control over, specifically over our mind, but to gain control over one's mind, it has to 
start from the body to have control over one's body, then over one's prana, then ultimately comes the control over one's mind. So that just, the perspective is always dharma, whether it is the Buddha or it is the yogic traditions. The yogic traditions start from ahimsa, as the, or maitri karuna, friendliness and compassion as the very basis and then develop on that. The same is Buddha. The Buddha call it, called it dhamma, the same word but in Pali, dharma. So, asana, pranayama, all these practices, they have to be seen in this context. That, that they bestow the strength, the capability to not only because talking about these principles is one thing, but then when it comes to live them in one's life, then a person requires tremendous strength. And that is what makes a, a, such a, a, a person like Mahatma Gandhi, who was, uh, who was, who was, who was uh, what should I say, we call it a man of two bones, just two, he just focused on two, the first two, ahimsa and satya, non-violence and truthfulness. Just these two, just these two. And for him, they, they were two different words, but in practice, they were the same thing. And he said, I know of no, no other God except truth. For me, truth itself in society is God. So saying that is easy, but actually to do it, that is where the strength of yoga is required. But yoga gives us with what we come to it. If we just want good health and we come to yoga with good health, then yoga gives us what, it, what we want. If we come with deeper desires to it, that this is what I want and through my practice of yoga, I want to get this out of it, then if I fail in my practice of ahimsa, in my practice of satya, and if I ask my practice of yoga to bestow that strength, to go deeper into ahimsa, into satya, then that strength is derived from the discipline that a person acquires through the practice of yoga. In this way, that is why often yoga is compared to a kalpa vriksha, you know, that mythological tree under which you stand and you desire Whatever you desire is given to you. Now what, it depends on your level of desire. If you, if, you, if you want this, then you get that and you go happy. You are happy with that and you, 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 you leave. But you fail to acquire the higher principles because you did not have the desire for it. Yoga is like that. Whatever desires we have from it. So we have to cultivate these desires within us and then we have to drive them out. We have to, sorry, we have to derive them from our practice of yoga. Because yoga gives us that strength. So that is what the idea of dharma stands for. Krishna says, whenever it declines and adharma rises, is on rise, that is when I manifest myself. What does that mean? What does... Decline mean, it is usually translated by decline, but does it really decline mean, does it really mean decline? We will discuss this in our next class. We will come back to this shloka again. So let us conclude with the prayer. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pashyantu, magaschid dukha bhag bhavet. Om shantihi, shantihi, shantihi. Of the record, <laughs> yes, my master used to say uh, you see a human can never be perfect
And don't expect any avatar to be 100% perfect.